My name is Carol, and I work by UNICEF here in New York, working with uh, education and emergencies. And uh, I just wanted to take the opportunity to briefly um, to, to introduce Jacob Kornson. He's with uh, he's the CEO and co-founder of Supertel Mobile Innovation. He's going to tell you a little bit about uh, about his organization and what they do. And um, and we wanted to reach out to Supertel as part of as a participant in this ongoing that we have of webinars on looking at innovative uses of technology to support the work that we do. And I think we've seen a lot of, kind of uh, interesting and different sort of examples. A lot of the, a lot of these companies that we reached out to do a lot of similar type of work. And there's some really interesting type work that um, Sutel is doing that we thought was sort of um, unique in terms of some of the other discussions that we've had. So Jake is going to give us a bit of an overview of all of some of the different work that he's currently involved in. And then we encourage people during the Q&A session to um, you know, maybe um, speak to some of the more specific questions that you might have in relation to your own work and uh, in your own context. So uh, maybe I will hand over to Jacob. And thank you very much for joining us. So thanks again to everyone. As Caroline mentioned, um, we develop mobile software platforms that support UN, uh, USAID, DFID, and other donor-funded development projects uh, across the globe. Uh, and it's a real honor to be here today. Uh, we work very closely with UNICEF, with Save the Children as well. Um, and what I'd like to do today is share some of the work we're doing in the education sector, as well as the emergency humanitarian response sector. So you get a picture of how mobile technology can be used to support programming in these areas. Just to give you a brief uh, overview of who we are and what we do, we are quite unique in the technology space in the sense that we all come from the development sector ourselves. While we create mobile software for uh, implementers and for education uh, ministries and institutions, and for aid responders, we also come from working at USAID, working at Save the Children, uh, and working at other uh, agencies and organizations. So for us, that has given us a key perspective on um, how technology can be designed appropriately for the aid sector. What we do is create customized, specific platforms which enable uh, people who are delivering educational services or otherwise to do so quickly and cost-effectively using mobile phones. Typically basic mobile phones, uh, but with a range up to smartphone devices, we use mobile text, mobile audio, uh, and mobile web as well in the work that we do. These are some of the areas that we focus on sectorally, but we're not by any means restricted to those areas per se. Um, we work as well in the health sector to some extent. We do a lot of work that focuses on young people. Um, and then we work in the area of microfinance uh, as well. Um, in addition to being practitioners, we are also knowledge managers ourselves. Uh, we work together with uh, implementers, with funders, and agencies like the GSM Association, the Umbrella Organization for Mobile Networks, and then also the Overseas Development Institute and other entities like those to produce lessons learned, resources, or products which synthesize some of the learnings that uh, we have gained through delivering services. So we come at this also from a knowledge management perspective as well. Uh, and I think that's something that's fairly unique uh, relative to the sector uh, as it develops as a whole. Just to give you a brief overview of what we do, we have a number of different core services, um, which again are uh, basic accessible mobile software services, which we create for specific development implementers, and they help get information to and from communities. Um, this is a rundown in a general sense. I'm going to walk you through so you get a flavor for what's possible in each of these different settings. Um, each of these services in a little bit of detail. The overall uh, common thread between all of the services that we deliver is that they're developed in a customized way specifically for 
uh, the aid sector implementers who request them. They're not a one-size-fits-all or off-the-shelf product. We work very closely with the project and with the teams that are delivering assistance on the ground to ensure that the technology is appropriate for the settings that they're working in. So let me walk through each of these to just give you an idea of how they work. I'll touch on more, in, some in more detail uh, and some in a little bit less detail um, given their closeness to the education sector. But if there's something you'd like to learn more about, just let us know and I'll be happy to follow up with more info. Um, across the board, again, the key goal of these services is through using mobile technology to really increase access for underserved communities, uh, to save time in reaching out to large numbers of people, and to save resources as well. This is the core service that we began delivering about seven, eight years ago now. It's targeted towards internally displaced persons, refugees, disadvantaged community members who come out of the education system and are looking for jobs but do not necessarily have the resources or the tools to find work. And so what we created to fill that gap was a basic service which enables, as you can see, job seekers to send information about their qualifications via simple text messaging. And those qualifications can then be searched for by employers. And at the same time, employers can send basic information out via mobile about jobs that are available, whether that's in a refugee camp, in an informal community, or elsewhere. And that information can then be searched by people who are looking for work. So the goal here is in an education and emergency setting or a crisis zone, you've got a ready-made uh, solution for linking labor supply and labor demand, whether that's with long-term employment, skills training, educational courses, hard skill or soft skill. Uh, this platform is used in a number of different areas to fulfill those needs, both in Palestine, in regions like Gaza, in Iraq for internally displaced Iraqis, in Somalia for internally displaced Somalis as well. Um, and typically our rollout of this technology is done in partnership with organizations like PLAN or the UN or UNICEF. So that's on the workforce side of the education spectrum, a quick look at what we do there. I want to take you through in a bit more detail a service that we have developed for teachers in particular. And this, as you can see, focuses on helping teachers send, set goals at the start of an academic year and then send feedback as well to the ministry level, to the district level, and so forth about certain issues that are relevant to classroom instruction or education in emergencies. Now the way the goal tracking system works is very basic. At the start of the year, uh, teachers receive a greeting message from, in this case, Save the Children, inviting them to send back a text message with their instructional goal for the coming school year. The objective here is to help teachers really crystallize their thinking uh, at the start of the school year about milestones they'd like to achieve. And then also, as the year goes on, give them an opportunity to monitor their progress. So a teacher can enter her goal or his goal at the start of the year, and then that goal gets stored in a cloud-based system. So here you have the goal submitted by one teacher, sent in by SMS. That goal gets stored in the cloud, and as the year goes on, she or he will receive periodic check-in messages saying, hey, at the start of the year, here's a goal that you stated. Now, how is your progress toward that goal? Give us a number from one to five, where one means I'm really not meeting that goal at all, and five means, yes, I'm very close to meeting that. And so this happens at periodic intervals along the continuum of the school year. And it really serves two purposes. On the one hand, the teacher is able to get check-ins and for their own benefit, understand how they're progressing toward their goal. They can also see their score by SMS throughout the year. And at the same time, the 
organizer or manager of the service, in this case here, can also see on aggregate all of the teacher self-rankings that come into the system. And so they can very quickly understand whether teachers need additional support, whether they need additional uh, feedback, additional training, and so forth. There are different ways in which we depict the data for education and emergency providers. Here's one. This is relating to uh, constitutional content, but the concept here is one we use for teacher goal track as well. Each of these red circles shows a magnitude of response by location. So here we know that 150 people have responded to this question from the very tip of the Horn of Africa. Further south, we see 41 responding uh, from the Mogadishu area. And so this gives a very clear graphical understanding of where teachers are located, where they're responding from. Something else that we do to support this type of goal tracking uh, and longitudinal support over time is that we create specific localized messaging systems which districts or education sector offices or regional entities or local entities can use at their own discretion to run their own versions of this. So rather than having one single national system, which in some cases makes sense, we also have the ability to create many systems for district level education offices or so forth so that they can each run their own versions of the teacher goal tracking uh, application. They can interact with teachers directly uh, and they're able to offer support at the local level. So this really puts the power of the technology in the hands of local users rather than uh, ensuring that it's consolidated strictly at one level or another. Just to look at the advantages of this system, they're generally, I think, clear, but it's worthwhile to go through them in some detail. Um, this is real-time communication between teachers and staff. There's also widespread accessibility for the technology to run and to access the system. You don't need to buy any specific hardware. You don't need to own a certain type of phone handset. Because it's being transmitted by a text message, teachers can use the handsets which most of them already have. Um, just a couple of examples in terms of where we offer this service. Um, so here in Kenya, we do classroom instructional KPI tracking, so key performance indicator tracking um, in various districts. We also use it for attendance monitoring for teachers. So in countries like Rwanda and Somalia, this type of system is being used uh, to both track student attendance in the classroom and then also teacher attendance in the classroom as teacher absenteeism is uh, an issue in certain communities where we work. But really the goal here is helping teachers like this one get better data, better support, uh, and a better strengthened ability to deliver their classroom instruction. So let me move on to another area of work that we do which builds on the goal tracking. This is a hotline which leads teachers to pre-recorded audio clips of instructional content or support content which helps them get assistance outside of face-to-face -face instructional or training sessions. The idea here is you're in your classroom, you need support, but you don't have a resource that you can consult right away. Um, so what these hotlines do is they enable you to call in to a local phone number to tell that phone number by making touch tone menu selections, a little bit about yourself, where you're located, what subject you teach, what your support needs are, and so forth. And then at any subsequent time, you can call into this hotline and you can access pre-recorded content area audio segments. And these are usually about three minutes in length, not too long, but they're able to convey key information. Um, when you select a specific topic, you can access time-based audio clips relating to that topic. So files that have been uploaded by the services manager, which is typically, again, an implementer like a Plan International or a UNICEF. 
uh, and then as a teacher you're able to on demand access that content and learn about the key subject area that you may need support on. Um, here we found this is a real advantage in places like the Horn of Africa um, where we find that in-service training and face-to-face -face training is quite limited and once teachers leave the site of the training they've often reported in the projects and for the partners that we work with that they find that they have a lack of uh, regular support or a lack of access to resource. So by enabling our partners to pre-record and upload and sequence and package all of these audio segments through the platforms that we create, we're really helping teachers get anytime, anywhere access to key information. It's personalized, uh, it's versatile, and it works in a number of different settings. Here are, pardon me, here are some of the examples. We uh, do financial literacy curriculum support in Somalia. Uh, and then in the Middle East, in an entirely different region, we do uh, workforce readiness curriculum concept support. Um, and again, we found that for teachers, this is a really effective way to get some of the support they need. Let me touch on another tangent service, which we provide in a number of different places. This is the notion of a closed chat group, somewhat like an email listserv, but for people who don't have regular email access, which in the countries we serve is the majority of people, particularly in the education sector. This peer net service lets a teacher send a single text message to a coded hotline. And that coded hotline corresponds to a group that the teacher may be part of. That group can be themed around a specific instructional concept. It can be themed around a location. It can be for female teachers only. Um, but the teacher sends a single message with a question into that group. And if someone in the group knows the answer to the question, they're able to text back to the individual who posed the question or to the entire group. And what this enables is real-time knowledge sharing between teachers in various locations. Someone wants to know about resources for teaching basic addition in a math class, someone else has an answer and can follow up directly with their colleague. The peer networking we found is tremendously useful, again, to support teachers who may not have access to colleagues or to other resources in their communities, which, as it turns out, is a majority of teachers in a majority of environments that we serve. We work in Africa, Asia, and to some extent, the Americas. It's discreet as well, in the sense that if you may be um, timid, let's say, or not uh, comfortable asking in a giant, uh, you know, 200-person uh, session of training a question that's pertinent to your classroom, this is a more personalized and individualized way for you to interact with, uh, with your peers and your colleagues. Um, we do this in Iraq. We do this in uh, West Bank and Gaza. And we now have just started running this service in 12 different countries across West Africa, East Africa, and Asia. Um, we started it several years ago. It, it became so tremendously popular and successful that we're now actively scaling this up. So again, the idea that it's a small group of peers, typically no more than 20 or 30, to, with, of, whom you're, of which you're a member, and you can text a question to the group and the group can respond. And we have you now hundreds of these groups set up based on interests uh, and based on different teacher locations. Um, just to touch on one final service which we provide, which is more pertinent, I suppose, to emergency situations. We use it for a range of different purposes, um, shipping uh, medical supplies, shipping educational inputs, materials, whether that's books, pencils, etc. Um, what the service does is it enables better package tracking for organizations that are shipping items from a warehouse to a distribution site. And it helps solve the problem of packages disappearing, packages getting lost, packages not arriving at their intended destination. 
This uh, does use uh, smartphones to uh, scan codes on packages. So what happens is when you're ready to ship a package, you print a package barcode for it. You're then scanning that package with a QR code scanner, which registers the code on the package. Um, and then you're able to track by GPS where that package goes as it leaves the warehouse and then checks in via mobile at its destination. Um, there are uh, detailed analytics here as well which let you understand where the package has gone, how many packages have been delivered, and so on and so forth. We use this very actively right now in Syria, refugee relief across Syria itself, in Jordan, uh, and now shortly in Turkey and Iraq as well. So again, as it pertains to education, we're ensuring that supplies are getting to the people who need to receive them and in a timely fashion. Um, as pertains to medical supplies and food items, it's the same principle. I just want to wrap up by touching on some of the things we've learned through our close to 10 years now of service delivery. And these are really lessons which we apply to the work that we do uh, and which may be useful as well to you all as you look to implement similar types of technology in your own work. So the first thing that to us is crucial is that software is designed in a customized way so that it meets the needs of your project. This is not um, the replication of something which worked in Tanzania and therefore it must work in Togo. Uh, every project is different. Every project has different criteria, different needs, and as a result we believe that software should be customized to meet those needs. We also value active engagement of what typically are referred to as home office and field office, uh, meaning that if you have an office in the US or in Europe and then you've got a field office at the site where you're implementing your projects, we really focus on good training up front of the individuals who will be managing the software. And that's a key part of what we do. It doesn't have to be long training, but it's important to have that interactivity so that people can ask questions, get comfortable with the technology, and so forth. In situations where cost is a concern, we do the training remotely, as we do now. We do it over the phone. We do it over video conference. But we just make sure that the users and the implementers of the technology feel comfortable with its use and are in a good position to be managing and administering the system. The other thing we focus on is direct partnerships with mobile networks. So in all of the countries where we work, we partner directly with the operators in those countries, whether that's Airtel in Africa, whether it's Zane in the Middle East. This gives us direct access to pricing of the services, to technical support from the networks, to setting up of hotlines, and it ensures that the services themselves run much more smoothly. We have a team of people whose sole focus it is to get this work done with the mobile networks. We also think it's important to share lessons learned from projects across an entire portfolio. So we run in a given year anywhere from 15 to 25 different mobile services for our partners. And as I mentioned at the start, what we try to do and what I would encourage uh, you know, teams to do as well is really synthesize the key lessons learned and try to apply them as much as possible to new technology. We often find in some of the larger organizations we serve that a project has been delivered in one country and there have been lessons learned there, positive and negative, and then when the project is being rolled out in another country, there's a different team and that knowledge is not transferred. I'm sure if you're a knowledge management specialist, you're very well aware of this. Um, so what we try to do is really encourage that cross-sectoral knowledge sharing. And then the final component is ensuring that there's frequent interaction with pe the people who use the technology. So you don't just want to roll a service out and then leave it hanging there. It's important for interaction with the end users, the people who are teachers, students, job seekers, any of the users that I've described, um, that you interact frequently with them so that we understand what their needs are, what their requests are, whether they like the service. We do a lot of follow-up with our service users to 
to ask how we can improve the content, the quality, the structure of the service, and so forth. Um, just finally, again, just to give a, an, an understanding of how we work as an organization, um, we work both on new projects and then on current projects uh, that may be underway. So we will typically bid with partner organizations uh, on uh, specific uh, new solicitations that come out so that when you're designing a project, the technology strategy or component is there right from the start and it forms a key part of the work that is done. Otherwise, we always have partners coming to us saying, hey, I've got a project that's currently underway. What can you guys do to support it if I've got a limited budget? Um, and again, it would, in your own work, I would encourage uh, the same type of approach. It's obviously preferable if there's an entry point for technology to have that be factored into the initial project design. But in a targeted and focused way, there are still great ways you can incorporate technology across the spectrum, uh, even if your project is already happening. So that's an overview of, of who we are, of what we do, um, of how we have implemented mobile tech uh, in a number of ways to support your teams. Great. Thank you very much, Jacob.